Welcome back to Vast Forward. I'm Daniel Bounds, Vice President of Marketing here at Vast Data, and today we're going to double click on the topic of scale. And joining me for our conversation today is Andy Pernsteiner. Andy is the uh, field CTO for us at Vast. Andy, welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for having me. So as, as we think about what scale means, give us the, the quick and dirty in terms of the, the challenges in a shared nothing infrastructure like Dell EMC Isilon, or, or now it's called PowerScale. What are some of those challenges that are inherent to the way that that, that uh, solution is architected? It's a great question. You know, I think when we thought about what we were going to build at Vast, we looked very closely at shared nothing architectures such as PowerScale, as you mentioned. Um, and one of the things that we realized was that in a shared nothing architecture, every node in the cluster has ownership of some data. And that ownership means that you have to make sure that that, that node stays up at, by all means possible. However, there are a number of components within each node which are not protected well, uh, that are CPU, memory, the operating system, all of the various controllers that exist within it. All of those things are not protected. If you have a CPU error or if you have a, even a single memory error, it can take an entire server down. And with taking that server down, it goes with it all of the storage that was attached to it. And because of that, what we've found is that there's, there's a lot of risk to having a shared nothing architecture because there's all these different things that can fail. Even things that you wouldn't think about failing can fail and that, that whole server is going to go away. Um, and the side effect of it going away is that now all of a sudden you have all of this data that th that server was owning and that ownership means that you have to do something to make sure that that data is still accessible. Now obviously shared nothing architectures protect against node failure, but the side effect of that is that they must rebuild that data in order to bring the system back to full protection. And so if a single server fails for any reason and uh, you, the customer, or anyone is at a, in a window of risk, you can make the choice to initiate a rebuild of that data, but when we're talking about potentially hundreds of terabytes of data sitting behind a single node, that can take days, weeks, I've even heard months from customers, and during that period of time, there is a significant performance degradation. So Andy, what I, what I think I hear you saying is with shared nothing infrastructures, you've got stability and performance both of which get impacted by the rigidity of the infrastructure or the architecture itself. But to me, what's also interesting as we look at scale in the petabyte, exabyte era, what happens to both performance and stability? That's another great point. Um, as, as systems scale, um, the probability of failure actually starts to go up. So imagine you have 10 servers, um, and let's say you have a, you know, a 1% chance that one of those servers will fail on a, a given day or a given month. As you have more and more servers, let's say now you have 100 servers, uh, well there's a much higher chance. Now, now in theory you're at a 10% chance that there's going to be some server failure in that same window of time. So first off, you have more nodes, it means there's a higher chance there's going to be a failure. When a shared nothing node goes offline, um, it's going to impact every user and every node in the cluster because Every node needs to talk to each other in order to make sure the cluster is stable. And so if there's an issue with any of the nodes, it doesn't matter if it's the node that you're talking to or the node that some other user is talking to, you're all impacted. And that's just the fundamental design of shared nothing. Um, shared nothing, a node owns some amount of disk, but it can't own the entire transaction. A user talking to node one again, that node doesn't get to own everything. It has to go and ask node two for data, node three for data, and if one of those is slow to respond, or even worse, if one of those doesn't respond, then the user is directly impacted. So, so these challenges are obviously very significant in the, in the context of, of shared nothing, but let's, let's flip it around. When we, we've talked some on previous videos around our days infrastructure, our disaggregated shared everything, what does it mean for customers who, who want to deploy this type of infrastructure? Well, I'm glad you led into that. Uh, you know, the first thing that I like to explain to people anytime I explain the day's architecture is to get in their heads this, this concept of logic versus state. 
In a shared nothing world, they're combined into a single server. In a shared everything world, like we have, we've taken the logic and we put it into a, one layer and we've taken the state and put it into another layer. And what that means is that none of the decisions get made at the state layer and none of the persistence happens at the logic layer. When data gets read or written to one of the servers, one of the stateless servers in our system, uh, that server is solely responsible for persisting it to the media that it can see. And all of the servers can see all of the media. And that means that the servers don't need to talk to each other. Um, it also means that if a server fails, we don't have to do a rebuild, which is, which is a huge advantage over a shared nothing architecture. Because it doesn't impact other applications when a server fails, we don't have this problem where as the system scales, it gets less resilient. And so that's you know, sort of the primary reason why we, we've, we've built this architecture um, is to make sure that by separating the logic from the state that we don't have to worry about things like server failure anymore. So, so does that mean that for customers who deploy shared everything infrastructure, can they really achieve the, the type of performance scaling that, that we would expect? Is it truly linear? Well, yes, uh, you know, we've, we've been able to prove out in our laboratory as well as obviously in our real world customer environments that regardless of where your starting point is and where you get to, we scale linearly. Um, what's interesting is that while we scale linearly, we also have the ability to scale in the direction that the customer chooses to go. Um, when we talk about disaggregating the logic from the state or the compute from the storage, what it means is that we can scale those two layers independently as well. Um, and so customers who are wishing to scale out their capacity without necessarily scaling out their performance don't need to go and purchase additional performance. Conversely, sometimes customers need more performance, but they don't really need more capacity. And so we have the ability to scale those as well, uh, which really means that customers, when they're building a vast system, it's almost as if they can't make a wrong decision. Many times when building a shared nothing architecture cluster, you have to choose up front which way you think you're going to go in terms of your business, in terms of your performance and capacity. And if down the road you find out that you made the wrong decision, it's a huge lift to re-architect your system to support whatever comes at you next. But with VAST, you can start with a very, uh, a very dense capacity and performance footprint, and if your needs change, we can evolve with it without requiring that you change everything that you've done already. So Andy, as I, as I sort of think about all of these aspects of scale and the, the differences between shared nothing and, and shared everything, one of the things that um, I've heard a lot, especially when we talk to customers who have deployed shared nothing for a very mm -hmm. long time, this idea of addressing topics like quality of service or addressing new applications in their environment with new clusters, how do you scale up to a big shared everything cluster? You know, interestingly enough, shared nothing systems are harder to consolidate applications on in many ways than on a shared everything system. And in fact, what we found is that a lot of customers will build multiple shared nothing clusters because the needs of each of their applications is such that they don't want them competing for resources. Um, a very sort of common use case is where customers have a mix of batch and interactive workloads. Uh, a batch workload would be something where you have a lot of machines attempting to do a lot of operations um, all at the same time, but at the same time that's happening, there are users who are attempting to do interactive work. They're trying to go and open up an Excel spreadsheet or they're trying to go and list the contents of their directory. Uh, and those things can compete against each other on a shared nothing system because as I mentioned earlier, in a shared nothing world, the east-west traffic ensures that every node has to participate even if it doesn't hold the data that you're trying to access. And so the way that we look at it is in a shared everything world, the node that you're talking to doesn't have to talk to anybody else, which means that if you take nodes or servers uh, and you pool them together into groups, uh, we call them server pools, each one of those pools is a distinct element and can operate independently of the other pools. And the way that that really boils down is that 
applications that demand a certain amount of performance can be allocated a certain number of servers. They can get their own pool. And then interactive users who want to be able to do normal day-to-day -day operations on the file system, they can be given to another pool, which gives them the ability to work at the same time without impacting each other. Um, and so the way that we've implemented this is, is very uh, sort of uh, dynamic in nature, meaning that customers can scale those pools up and down without having to change any hardware or, or do any sort of acrobatics to make it all work. All right, Andy, great, great way to end the session. Thank you so much for being a part of this and super important topic in terms of scale and really drawing the, the differences out between what VAS is doing and, and what legacy infrastructures have provided in the past. For everyone who joined us, thank you very much, and please stay tuned. We'll have new episodes of Vast Forward coming to you very soon. Goodbye and take care. Thank you so much.